Thank you, Edwidge, for this. Is this working? Yes. yes. For this uh, very courteous and, and wonderful introduction, I also want to thank everybody who has uh, contributed to my being here, MJ Fier, who invited me, and everyone at the Miami Book Fair. I also want to thank all of you for being here, because without all of you, there is no book fair and our books have no life and no meaning. So, um, as Edwidge said, my book is a memoir, so therefore it's my story. But it is also, um, the book tells about uh, Hades, my family, and my own struggles to um, outgrow political and personal violence, and uh, finding a way and telling how we um, outgrew it, overcame it, and uh, re-articulate, re-articulated our identity. The book is in two sections. One is called Innocence. The second section is Choice. Um, it retraces, as I said, uh, my family, also 200 years of uh, Haitian uh, history and and since it is my memoir, my story, so you will meet uh, all the people that we mentioned. I have chosen four small excerpts uh, from a variety of uh, chapters. There are 15 chapters to the book. Um, I will read the first two paragraphs of the, the, the first page of the book, and then it sort of introduces the milieu, the, the spirit of the place. Caribbean are a very unique place. And uh, then I will read uh, a little bit, I mean, the, the actually the, the first passages in the chapter on the history of Haiti, which is the second chapter of the book. And then uh, I will read the section um, about my experiences with Vodou. And uh, the last one is a chapter, is an excerpt taken from a chapter um, called fervor. It's really about spiritual fervor. Um, and so here we go. Lightning struck the tall tree sheltering my father's tomb in the garden of my childhood. The great being went up in flames, lighting up the night like a huge star. The burning tree acted as an otherworldly torch, leading my thoughts to the beyond, where a million other stars exist as golden seeds God spreads nightly to germinate our dreams. I tell myself how it is surely such a torch that in olden days, night templars held to assemble at their asylum before marching in the order of procession to the residence of the dead for the secret burial service of one of their own. But this street torch happened in Haiti and not medieval Europe. My father's grave was dug in the land where Christianity and Vodou coexist. Graham Greene wrote, there is something peculiarly Roman in the air of Haiti. Roman in its cruelty, in its corruption, and its in, hero in its heroism. The auguries are still told in the entrails of beasts. Haiti is the scene of a classical tragedy. At the beginning of 1964, a mysterious Haitian arrived at Jack Kennedy's gravesite in Arlington Cemetery. Historian Alex von Tuzman wrote in the Red Heat, Conspiracy, Murder, and the Cold War in the Caribbean. He took a pinch of earth from each corner of the grave. He opened a flacon and swished it around in the air above it. Finally, he plucked one dead flower from a wreath lying upon it. Papa Doc, it was said, 
needed the earth, the air, and the flower to summon Kennedy's soul, which he would then use to direct American foreign policy. Of course, reading this stuns a reasonable mind. But much of Haiti's history remains untold. The world has not cared enough. Island stories have caught the imagination of bright children and treasure hunters only. Haitian families keep their secrets in mahogany chests. There is meaning in this small fact. Deep meaning that relates to the underlying substance of the past and the sensitive nature of Haitian existence. A country's history can be studied through the geological stratification of its layers. Human lives are in layers as well and can be examined like geology. The stories we tell of ourselves reveal the ways in which we are stratified. We are a kind of earth, dust similar to that which we are meant to become and return to. We are ancient cities that can be uncovered by archaeological digs, showing how new rooms and space in us are continually added onto the old. Mainland people, nevertheless, everywhere are profoundly unconcerned with life in Haiti, the nature of its flora, its fauna, and its inhabitants. This disinterest has lasted since the time of Columbus first setting foot on the island, who will thereafter be credited for its discovery, thus marking the start of Haiti's recorded history and that of President Duvalier's messenger sent to pinch soil from President Kennedy's grave. Such disparate and far removed events are yet not unrelated, albeit admittedly singular. Haiti and America's narratives are interconnected. Plunder, betrayal, desecration, demise and rebirth are elements of every human story and of every land. The true theatrical highlight of these voodoo days is of Jean, whose struggle was not with a Gede, but with a warrior spirit named Barbara. And so, the greatest theatrical act surviving in my memory is that of Jean standing barefooted and barebreasted in the middle of a black bull's mutilated body. The Ogu warrior god, Barbara, demands a bull in sacrifice. This is a spirit who loves the brio of blood, the panache in standing upright inside an animal lying on its back cut open from throat to tail, pulled apart enough for a man to march inside as conqueror, tramping proudly over the shivering disorder of organs ripped asunder, severed head misaligned, skin laid on the ground haphazardly like a discarded coat, cut away from ribs that resembled organ pipes unfolded around Jean the way a Corolla would. Jean's white pants had turned red from the blood. His white guayabera shirt hung on a tree branch overhead and gently floated in the breeze like a flag. The ground surrounding the carcass was stained with blood that ran in dense rivulets. The silence from the roosters was noticeable in the hot afternoon. Their unusual quiet felt like a homage to the great black animal that had been led in with a rope the previous afternoon. Its head bent low, as if in deep understanding and resignation, and who became their comrade during that one night spent among them. Each of the roosters had a leg tied to the same needle ridden by our own tree that seemed like a dry menace looming over, but also stood 
as if in guard of them, while the speckled shade it cast over these flimsy creatures drew countless eyes of glaring light over the dusty ground on which they waited their turn. Jean emerged from the open torso of the beast like a reddening black lotus, gleefully singing aloud, knife in hand, unwilling to end the excitement of cutting pieces of meat and limbs from the bull's corpse. He distributed them to attendants who delighted in the generosity of this irrepressible god, reveling in open air while the sun warmed the earth, surrounded by speechless guests and devotees sitting a few feet away amidst Nora's delicate flower beds of pink and lavender. And what choice is there left for me in a world where the wonders of science do nothing to disprove the existence of another dimension of being? What choice do I have when confronted with an inacceptable reality? What choice but to abandon familiar weapons, habits, and malaise? What is left to lose in choosing unprecedented modes of prayer and go where space is truly cleared of this evil I see? Indeed, when once tangible world has collapsed, the only building blocks remaining are those of the spirit. The moment baptism is a point of departure, not a destination. The ill-loved, ill-interred, and broken-hearted beings line up for a chance to assimilate existence in a reinterpreted way. We are people, each day converting anew. People thereby, thereby committed to act on the gift of metamorphosis. So should we move about as if people alone with our own demons while a thousand worlds are waiting to burst out of our heads? Should we live like absent-minded window gazers and not with vision and coherence? Yes, I was born an innocent child, guilty of no single evil a gymnast who thereafter trained herself in performing feats of balance in the unending stream of traffic. And then my father died in a car crash, and I was on my own. Fate packed me off to America, like so many immigrants. We looked for freedom, the opportunity to shape one's own narrative in the vastness of space, sky and teeming cities declaring, I am my newfound land. Within each one of us waits a great fire in which to die and rise again. We have no other option but to transform. It is a high-minded urge to keep oneself under good management in the quiet lamplight very little points the way. The whole enterprise looks senseless enough. Close scrutiny is impossible, yet we cannot afford to be caught unawares, disrespecting truth, renouncing dreams of wholeness and belonging, claiming it had all gone by too fast. The experience was thin in too many ways, we did not know how to deepen it. I recognize my insignificance without self-pity. 
I nevertheless must acknowledge being in the hands of a master who must have taken some pride in what he might do with me. In choosing this baptism, I simply did what had to be done. <laughs>